Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Sullivan, and I'll be your host for today's installment of the Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Risk Management Webinar Series. This edition is titled Resilience in Action, Case Studies in Parametric Solutions. This is our Parametric 201 session, if you will, which builds upon the Parametric webinar we presented earlier this year. If you missed that webinar, you can go to the SwissRe.com website, navigate over to Corporate Solutions and Events to watch the replay. It will give you a good foundation in all things parametric. Today I'm thrilled to welcome back Cole Mayer uh, as our presenter. Cole has considerable experience structuring innovative risk solutions, including structured solutions, aggregate stop losses, missiles, and of course the parametric products we're going to hear more about today. Uh, before we get into the presentation, just a quick uh, logistic check. Uh, one, everybody's been muted. Uh, two, if you have questions, ask them in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. We'll get to those at the end. And then lastly, if in the unlikely event you have any technical difficulty, press Control F5 and that will reboot the ON24 platform. Now without further ado, uh, Cole, welcome back and over to you. Thank you, Chris, very much, and thank you to everybody uh, who's joining. Um, we'll, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, for, for many of you uh, who have joined our previous webinars or, or our previous parametric webinar, welcome back. For those of you who uh, have not, uh, welcome to the first webinar. We're really happy to have you. So today we'll explore, as Chris mentioned, uh, a little bit more of a deeper dive into um, parametric covers, specifically around uh, sort of case studies, how these can really uh, be used. So less about the mechanics, how they actually work, and more about how these can be used. Uh, so again, feel free to listen in on, on the previous webinar for more on how they actually work, specifically to earthquake and hurricane. Uh, we've done a hail webinar on the parametric side as well, so we've kind of done deep dives there, but now really want to arm you, our clients and brokers, with how to how these are sort of used in practice in real life. So we're we're very excited to present to you today. So before we start here, uh, I actually showed this slide in our HAIL webinar as well, but uh, unfortunately it, it, it's still very much the case, uh, if not even more so. So where are we today? Not a surprise to anybody on the phone here uh, in, in terms of some of these challenges, but um, uh, you know, starting from the left-hand side of the slide there, COVID-19 challenges, certainly everybody is well aware of the logistical challenges, many, many difficulties on, on a number of different fronts, um, just from a society perspective. Um, among those, significant revenue shortages and significant um, uh, issues for our insureds uh, sort of across the board. So unfortunately, uh, those disruptions will likely continue uh, for, for some time, not exactly sure how long, but uh, certainly a, a major, major issue facing our clients today. Um, in tandem, we have uh, a, a very difficult market environment. So, uh, you know, certainly we're all aware uh, due to continued losses in the space, um, this is true across you know, property liability, many different lines, you know, insurers are needing to shift their underwriting standards um, uh, in this, for, for hail exposed accounts certainly, but for many others as well. Um, insureds face some combination of, um, no surprise, increased rates, increased deductibles, as well as just lower overall, overall available capacity. Um, so a, a difficult uh, tandem of factors here between COVID-19 and, and a very difficult market environment. Finally, uh, you know, natural catastrophe loss frequency uh, and severity. So, so values at risk uh, continue to increase, uh, both from a, a, a frequency and, and severity of loss continues to, to increase. Uh, and this trend uh, is expected to continue. We, we've seen a very, very active uh, hurricane season. We're not out of the woods yet. Uh, and, and so um, certainly we expect these trends to continue. So a very, very difficult backdrop in which our clients are, are trying to operate. So ultimately we feel very strongly, and we'll explore um, how some of these parametric covers can be used, we feel they, they can really help our clients solve some of these problems or at least alleviate some of the pain associated with these problems. So again, very happy to explore these with you today. 
So just a quick refresher. This, this is going to be old news for many of you who joined our previous webinars. So I apologize. Uh, you, you can hold your ears for just a few minutes here if, if this is old news. But I thought it would be good to just ground ourselves one more time uh, in, in how these ultimately sort of work on a very high level. So uh, as we've talked about in previous webinars, um, parametric insurance in its purest form is simply insurance that, that pays based on a pre-agreed trigger, um, you know, typically on the natural catastrophe side, a physical parameter that drives the claims payment as opposed to a more traditional, uh, if we want to call it actual loss sustained, uh, boots on the ground claims adjustment. So what we're in effect trying to do here is pre-adjudicate the claim, if you will, using that physical parameter, which allows us to, to increase the speed significantly with which we pay. Uh, and also broaden the coverage uh, quite significantly. We'll get into both of those factors in detail in just a minute. Um, some examples of physical parameters that we can use, hailstone size, for example, hurricane wind speed, earthquake shake intensity, uh, and many, many others as well. And, and you can even extend um, sort of the parameterization, if you will, uh, into not just natural catastrophe, but many other areas, indices, for example, et cetera. So there's a lot of applicability here, um, both in the natural catastrophe space, which we'll focus on today, as well as uh, on a broader level. So if we look to the right-hand side of the screen here to this graphic, we'll kind of trace how this works. So um, on the top uh, little bubble there, the event occurs. And if we move down to the second bubble, the event intensity is reported from our third-party third, third party data provider. So we go to our data provider and we determine the intensity of the event using that physical parameter that we established. The third step there, we determine whether that intensity uh, meets or exceeds the pre-agreed threshold that we all agreed to ahead of time. Uh, if it does, we issue the payment quite quickly after the event, typically within 30 days of the event. And that final step there, very important to just spend a minute on, uh, the loss confirmation. So this is, in fact, an insurance policy, which means that the insured cannot profit from this cover. Um, so what we need to do is ensure that the parametric payout is not greater than the loss as defined under the policy. And we'll get into the details here in just a minute. Uh, but, but ultimately, that process involves, you know, we go ahead and issue the payment. Um, the insured has a certain amount of time, typically around a year, um, uh, after which the insured attests to us that, yes, in fact, my loss as defined under the policy met or exceeded the parametric payout. In other words, I did not profit from this parametric insurance cover. So this is what um, keeps us kind of well within the comfy confines of, of an insurance policy from a regulatory accounting perspective, et cetera. Um, as opposed to, you know, a financial product or a derivative. Okay, so if we look at the um, sort of four uh, main components or the backbone, if you will, the spine of a parametric insurance policy. So um, if we look at the left, uh, the location, so the geographic definition of the location. Uh, so typically a latitude, longitude coordinate, uh, maybe a zip code center. Uh, we, you know, we have to define ultimately where are we looking at the intensity of the event. Typically, it could, could be associated with the insured site, maybe a contingent location. Again, we'll get into some of those specific case studies here in just a minute. But the location is critical. The limit, pretty self-explanatory there, the policy limit, just like you would have in any other insurance policy. The data provider, very important. So this is um, uh, sort of the core of, of a parametric insurance policy because we're focused on that, on that actual physical parameter. And so the data provider is extremely important. Um, third party, so we can't control the data, nor can the client. It's just based on the best science and data available and reliable. So we know that even in chaotic uh, natural catastrophe events, the insured, or rather the data provider will be there after the fact and will be reporting the, the metric that we need. So finally, the payout table. So this is where we define the threshold at which we pay the insured some money. And so you can see in this case, we use hail size as an example. You could substitute hurricane wind speed, uh, earthquake shake intensity, 
ultimately the intensity at which we pay money. Typically, it's going to be what we call stepped. So as the intensity of the event increases, you can see here, as the hail size increases, the corresponding payout increases. So that sort of mimics um, the pain that the client feels as the event gets more intense or the severity increases. So these are really the four main components of a parametric insurance policy. So why parametric insurance? And we're going to explore here in just a minute how these, these different sort of categories bear out in various scenarios and case studies. But, but ultimately, we find uh, many, many benefits are conveyed, and, and often they fall into one of these three categories. Uh, so the first is speed. So we explored that a couple slides ago, but because we're in effect pre-adjudicating the claim with that physical parameter, we can pay much, much quicker than a typical traditional insurance policy can pay. Uh, so typically, again, within 30 days. So that gives the insured liquidity when they need it most, immediately post-event. Um, also helps bridge that time gap while the indemnity claims adjustment is being completed. Uh, so very, very important um, a benefit to convey to our clients. That middle box there, broad cover, so this is another, particularly when working together with the speed benefit, very, very powerful. Uh, so once the parametric trigger is hit, the physical parameter is met or exceeded, um, coverage is going to be much broader than, than the typical indemnity policy. So in effect, the insured can use the funds for any loss associated from the event or associated with the event, uh, any financial loss. So that could include certainly physical damage, could include uh, a retention in a traditional program, um, or topping up sublimits, covering excluded expenses, wide area non-physical damage. Again, we'll get into the case studies in terms of how this can be used in practice. But when combined with speed, very, very uh, powerful for our insureds. Finally, flexibility. Uh, so these covers, by design, are, are custom. Uh, so it's, it's a bit akin to um, sort of a, a custom tailor-made suit as opposed to sort of an off-the-rack model, right? Um, so what that allows uh, is us to, to very specifically and acutely structure these covers to solve problems for the insured, as opposed to sort of a one-size-fits-all, trying to fit, make the solution fit the problem uh, or rather, the, the, the problem fit the solution. It's, it's sort of the opposite. We try to make the solution fit the problem, as it were. So, so very flexible in terms of the structuring options we have. So how can parametric uh, insurance cover or NATCAT insurance cover solve the insured's problem? So um, a, a few different ways, and we're going to see case studies for each of these. Um, so you can kind of see the graphics here starting on the left. Uh, pretty simple example, uh, infill a large natural catastrophe deductible. So if we think back to the, the slides a couple slides ago, what are our insureds facing? You know, increased retentions, particularly on the NATCAT side, uh, are, are kind of top of the list, right? Um, using a parametric cover with, a, with kind of a broad definition of loss can help infill that um, sometimes significantly larger deductible, you know, percentage deductible, for example. Um, so very powerful there. Can also be used looking at the middle box there as a supplement for indemnity limits or peril sublimits. So, um, you know, again, you, you sort of have uh, above that uh, sublimit, you have a, in effect a client retention, right? If the loss exceeds that, parametric cover can, can be used to sort of plug that gap, if you will. And then finally, looking at the right-hand box there, um, cover excluded expenses. So a very broad category here, uh, but, but some examples might be you know, what we would call non-damage business interruption or wide area damage business interruption or extra expense. Uh, employee assistance, so helping employees, uh, you know, temporary housing, childcare, all of, all of the stuff that helps clients get back up and running, but may be difficult to find coverage, for example, additional property policy. Um, you know, as we mentioned, extra expenses not covered by traditional insurance, many, many others as well. One of the cool things is we always are finding new ways for our insureds to sort of use these, uh, and, and very often our insureds come up with ideas, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of a cool thing. It is quite broad in terms of 
of the applicability. Okay, so with that, we'll dive into kind of the meat and potatoes here. So the case studies, which we're very excited. So, so hopefully these, we're, we're going to go through four of them. Uh, and I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions as well. But hopefully this will give you a flavor for um, some of the main ways that we've seen our insureds use these covers. And so uh, we, we've sort of scrubbed the names uh, to protect the innocent, as it, as it were. But, um, you know, these are um, kind of based on real world um, covers that, that we've structured for our clients. Uh, and, and so you'll see, uh, you know, exactly kind of how these various areas uh, or, or covers can be used in different ways to, to kind of supplement the overall natural catastrophe programs on the traditional side that, that our insureds have. So the, the first case study here, we talked about this, alluded to this earlier, but supplementing traditional insurance. So uh, we'll kind of present, and you'll see the structure, we'll present the problem uh, or the situation that the insured's dealing with, and then we'll explore the solution and, and ultimately why it works. So here in this case, if, if we can imagine for a minute, ABC Company operates a $100 million hotel in San Francisco. Um, it buys traditional earthquake up to $25 million. Perhaps that's uh, a lender requirement or they're, they're conservative and, and just want to buy uh, earthquake insurance. They buy it up to $25 million, but they feel this might not be enough. Uh, in addition, they're also concerned about the large deductible, percentage deductible that they take uh, and any expenses that may fall through the cracks uh, of, their, of their traditional policy. So if we look at the program structure, uh, we've got uh, in red there, the red bubbles are the, the ABC's CO's retention uh, within sort of their earthquake risk profile, if you will. Uh, and then the blue is the insured layer. So uh, in this case, they've got a 5% deductible, so they've got a $5 million retention. And then the blue insurance layer, layer kicks in. Uh, and then on top of that, they've got you know, about a $70 million retention on the top above the insured layer. If we look at the right there, uh, sort of the bubble going onto the, the side of the main uh, property tower, you've got all of those other expenses, and it's, you kind of designate that with a question mark, but it's, you know, again, some of the expenses we talked about a slide ago or two, um, you know, employee assistance, wide area damage, um, for example, you know, a, a significant drop in tourism due to an earthquake, uh, maybe not necessarily due to physical damage at ABC, or that at this hotel, but, but people stop coming to San Francisco uh, for a period of time and, and the hotel revenue dips. So all of those um, sort of unknown expenses after a large event, those are also fully retained at this point by ABC, right? So if we look at uh, the potential solution here, um, here ABC Co. might buy for example, a $25 million parametric earthquake limit in addition to their $25 million um, uh, maybe standalone earthquake or, or earthquake limit built into their traditional policy. So um, what does that do for them, right? So it, it provides quick liquidity, uh, as, we, as we discussed, while the traditional uh, natural catastrophe, in this case, earthquake claim is being adjusted. It helps infill those red retained areas. I'll show you a graphic here in just a, a, a slide later. Uh, and provide coverage for some of those areas we just discussed, wide area damage, business interruption, infrastructure damage, uh, drop in tourism, uh, et cetera. So uh, if we think now about you know, sort of the backbones uh, of the insurance policy that we talked about, um, how we might go about structuring this, uh, on the left box there, define the location. So you can see, apologize, it's a little bit small there, but the hotel um, there in kind of the financial district of San Francisco there, that's the, the yellow um, dot there. We define our data provider. So in this case for earthquake, we would use the USGS uh, shake intensity trigger. And then we define the policy terms. So the limit, in this case, we talked about 25 million, right? A shake intensity trigger, there's an example of a payout table we might use for earthquake. And then obviously the premium, so the, the pre-agreed policy terms. So what we've done here is we've structured a $25 million parametric earthquake cover. Uh, and what does that ultimately do? Why does that work? 
So if we look at why this works, so, so we'll, we'll kind of direct first to the, the lower side of the screen there, the, the lower half, where we now see the tower again, but we plug in the parametric cover. Right? So the $25 million limit, if you recall, um, this is one of many ways it could be used to supplement, right? Uh, but for example, you could use 5 million of it to supplement the deductible, another 10 million to supplement the limit, right? So um, now you've got cover up to including the $5 million deductible up to 40 million, right? So that retention up top moves from 70 to 60. And then you've also, if you look at that side tower there, all of those unknowns, you could plug in, for example, $10 million, right, to help cover some of those unknowns as well. Now, you could mix and match this $25 million limit sort of however you choose, which is, which is one of the key benefits in terms of the broad cover, right, so being able to plug this into a number of different areas in the tower, if you will. So from a, from a time perspective, if we think about kind of the two main benefits here, high-level benefits, pays out very quickly. So it gives ABC Co. in this case quick liquidity to get their hotel back up and running um, and bridges that time gap between the loss and the time the traditional claim is adjusted, as well as the broad coverage. So can cover the retention, supplement sublimits, um, cover, help cover non-damage business interruption or wide area damage type exposures. So hopefully this visual kind of gives you a sense for how uh, you know, one of the many ways uh, these can be used to ultimately supplement traditional insurance. Um, most of our insureds, in fact, do buy both traditional natural catastrophe insurance to the extent available, and they supplement it with uh, a parametric cover. And you can see how they, they actually are quite powerful when they work together here in this case. So the main message here, sort of the first of the, of the first case study here, um, parametric NACCAN insurance can help our clients fill in the gaps of their traditional coverage. Uh, very, very powerful parametric NACCAN insurance covers when used together with traditional insurance. Okay, if we move to case study two, Contingent exposure, again, a, a hot button issue, uh, particularly as supply chains get more and more complex and as um, you know, contingent business interruption, contingent extra expense limits available in the property world are, are more and more constrained. So uh, if you'll allow another example here, so here we have XYZ company who owns a retail operation uh, with significant operations in, in California. Um, XYZ's products are actually manufactured overseas. They're sent to the US through the port of Long Beach, just as an example. Right? So they're manufactured, come over the ocean, come into port of Long Beach, and, and they're then picked up and distributed to the various retail outlets. XYZ's traditional program provides 5 million of contingent business interruption earthquake cover. Um, which, which could be applicable in this case, loss uh, at, at the port. But XYZ feels they have at least a $50 million exposure, 5-0, to a significant outage at the port. Plus, they've got a significant NATCAT retention under the traditional program that would likely apply uh, before any CBI limit from a natural catastrophe would apply. So if we look at uh, sort of the best case scenario here for them from a program structure perspective, uh, for their contingent earthquake risk to the port, you've got, again, a, a $5 million, let's say, retention, for example, uh, then a $5 million traditional insured layer on the CBI side, and then a $40 million retention to get us up to that $50 million exposure that XYZ um, thinks they have at the port. Right? So quite a bit of red there, obviously. If we think about how a parametric insurance cover could be used to help solve this problem, in this case, ABC could buy a $45 million parametric earthquake limit. So, so how would that sort of be structured in this case? So remember now, we're dealing with a contingent exposure or a non-owned asset 
as opposed to uh, the insured's assets themselves. So if we look at the box there down at the bottom, uh, kind of same structure here we're thinking about. Uh, in this case, uh, the port of Long Beach uh, is going to be the location. Right? So we put a red pin on the port of Long Beach. Um, we define our data provider. So in this case, same data provider as before, the USGS. And we define our policy terms, same as before. Right? Um, so very similar in structure. Uh, what we've done is now we've selected a third party or a contingent exposure as our location as opposed to the insured's own asset, right? Um, so we've used the port as the trigger location. So in this case, significant shaking at the port is what triggers the policy, right? Um, so this would provide broad coverage. So again, they can use it for any loss associated with the event. Um, uh, to help fill in the CBI earthquake deductible as well as supplement any CBI limits in the traditional program. So key point here is we've substituted the insured's owned asset as the trigger location for the third party asset or the contingent asset. So why does this work? Um, in this case, if we, so if we look again to the bottom, bottom screen there, We've got um, now the green is where we plug in the parametric cover. The red was the a ABC's retention. In that case, as you can see, uh, that has gone away. Uh, and the blue is the traditional insured CBI layer. So now what we've done is we've plugged the parametric cover uh, into that $5 million retention. We've still got that traditional insured layer. And uh, to round us up to $45 million parametric limit, we've got um, the, the $40 million um, parametric limit on the top there. So, so we've plugged in the parametric cover um, because it's broad and can be used for in, in a number of different ways. We've plugged that in for the uh, what was previously the retained areas of the tower. So from a, uh, a coverage perspective, obviously again supplements the traditional CBI deductible and CBI supplement, as well as again provides quick liquidity. Uh, so, so maybe, for example, the insured um, uh, XYZ might say, um, it, it, I'm going to divert from the port of Long Beach, which is, which is down because of an earthquake, to, for example, the port of Oakland. Right? So I'm going to get my stuff in. I've just got to do it a different way, and that's going to cost me more money. Right? And it's going to cost me more money quite quickly. So receiving liquidity quickly to make those alternate arrangements, extra expense, if you want to call it that, um, contingent extra expense to get their product in the U.S. and keep it on the shelves. Um, uh, very, very helpful to receive quick liquidity to do that and make such arrangements. So we've seen many of our insurers use um, this type of cover, the parametric cover, given how broad the coverage can be, to infill or, or help cover contingent exposure. Very, very powerful use uh, of, of a parametric cover. Okay, so the main uh, takeaway here for case study two, parametric NACCAT insurance can help our clients cover contingent exposures or supplement contingent uh, BI or extra expense limits in the traditional program. Very powerful. Okay, case study three. So this is a case where no traditional coverage is available. So we're going to use, um, uh, in this case, LMN Utility Company uh, owns and operates a power generation and distribution uh, operation and equipment in, for example, Tampa, Florida. And so, so many of you on the call may know where this is going. Uh, so, so LMN's traditional uh, property program covers their power generation assets, covers their substation assets. What it does not cover uh, is their distribution, transmission and distribution assets. Uh, standard property exclusion, as, as many of you on the phone know. Um, so very often, uh, you know, loss, for example, is, is ultimately borne um, by, the, by the rate payers, right, passed on. Um, uh, and, and so it, it can be very disruptive in terms of loss to these types of assets. Um, in, in many, many storms. We all hear about the power outages that, that occur in, in various storms. So very, um, it, it's a, a difficult exposure to cover and address and can be very costly to both the ratepayers and the utility. 
So in this case, LMN retains, if we think about their transmission and distribution exposure, 100% of the risk of loss to their TND assets. Uh, in this case, being in Tampa, Florida, their most significant risk is hurricane. So if we look again at our program structure, um, the red ABC's, or, or sorry, this should be LMN, sorry, LMN's retention. Uh, and in the blue, uh, you have the traditional insured layer. Now, in this case, obviously, there, there isn't any blue. Uh, so ABC, in this case, is retaining 100% of their $100 million T&D risk exposure. No traditional coverage available anywhere in the market for this. Okay, so how can the insured potentially address this, this shortfall in traditional cover? So um, in this case, for example, LMN utility could buy a $50 million parametric hurricane cover. Uh, and, and what does that do? So if we recall, um, a, a parametric cover is quite broad in terms of the coverage. Um, because we're using the physical parameter uh, to, to adjust this claim, um, ultimately we as the insurer are much more comfortable covering a, a broader array of assets than we typically would be on the traditional side. Uh, you know, ultimately, again, what we're looking at is simply the probability of, a, of, of an event causing this level of intensity, you know, or, or occurring with this level of intensity or higher, um, uh, as opposed to trying to figure out the vulnerability of the assets and, and, and all of that stuff. So that, in turn, leads us to be much more comfortable with covering a broader array of assets. So in this case, we could give a $50 million parametric hurricane cover, um, uh, put the trigger locations where the insured has T&D assets. Now, there's a number of different ways we could do that. You can see down there on the bottom, some, in this case, LMN utility has a nice kind of grid and knows exactly where they have TND assets in, in these geographic little grid cells. We could also um, uh, weight by population density. So we could use zip code centers by population density, assuming you know, the TND assets are going to be heavier where more people live. Right? So many different ways you can sort of structure that. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to put the trigger locations and the limit where those T&D assets are. Um, and the, the parametric cover itself provides broad coverage for you know, both PD uh, and associated business interruption for the T&D assets. Right? So, so much broader than you would typically get in any traditional insurance policy. So um, we've defined the trigger locations there in step one. We define our data provider. In this case, we're going to use uh, RMS HWIND, which is what our parametric storm policy uses, which, which those of you who joined us on the previous calls know. Um, and we've defined the policy term. So again, same thing. I define the limit. There's a payout table by wind speed. How much are we going to pay the client at a certain wind speed? And the premium associated with that. So again, here what we're doing is we're we're filling in a, a gap where no traditional insurance coverage is available in the market. So why does this work? Again, just looking at the program structure with the parametric now. So you can see the green parametric cover. We've now plugged in um, 50 million of that $100 million retention. Certainly they could buy more to try to plug the whole thing in. Here in this case, they've decided you know, we'll buy a, a, a parametric limit for sort of half of our exposure. We'll take the other half, right? But significantly alleviates the retention and the pain that that um, uh, LMN utility feels in this case from T&D loss. So what has it done? It's, it's provided, uh, the parametric cover has provided broad coverage covering physical damage and BI to the T&D assets, which were previously uh, or are continued to be excluded under the traditional cover. And again, has provided very quick liquidity to make necessary repairs to the infrastructure. As we all know, uh, as, as rate payers, utility rate payers, we want them to get up and running as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so a quick, quick liquidity to do that is very, very important. So our key message here, Parametric NACCAN insurance can help our clients cover traditionally excluded exposures. Again, a very powerful way to use these covers.
Okay, one more case study, and then I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, case study four. Uh, so this is uh, a, a bit more unique one, uh, but but uh, we've seen many insureds entertain and, and purchase covers for this reason. So what we'll call non-damage business interruption or non-damage extra expense exposure. Um, so if, if uh, you'll indulge, here, here's the problem. Um, a U.S. county buys traditional insurance for its owned assets. So um, you know, all of the, the courthouse and, and all of the infrastructure and all of that, um, obviously insured under the traditional uh, insurance cover. However, they're concerned about potential lost revenue as a result of a hurricane hitting the area. Um, not necessarily due to physical damage to their own assets, but due to physical damage in the wider area. And so the county estimates a potential revenue shortfall, in this case, of $75 million. So how would this county actually lose revenue? If they don't have damage to their stuff, you know, what, what's really their issue here? Um, a couple things. Uh, so it could be lost property tax revenue uh, due to you know, reassessed property values that are assessed lower after the event uh, or potentially permanent resident movement, you know, uh, significant damage and a, and a large number of residents simply move. Uh, that, it also could be lost sales tax revenue due to, to store a restaurant closure. We've seen, you know, obviously the impact of COVID is a bit different, but we've seen how that can lead to significantly reduced tax revenue uh, over time uh, and just simply fewer residents buying things as a result of this damage. Uh, so in this case, as we know, traditional insurance is meant to cover property damage and business interruption due to loss at the county's assets. Um, what it won't cover is um, tax revenue due to wide area damage loss. You know, not necessarily revenue loss tied to damage to their assets, but revenue loss tied to the wide area damage uh, in the county itself. So again, looking at our, our trusty structure here, um, the red is ABC's retention when it comes to wide area damage revenue loss. Uh, the blue, again, is, is traditional. In this case, no traditional insurance coverage for this exposure specifically. So how can the county address this issue? The county buys a $75 million parametric hurricane cover. So in this case, um, essentially what they estimate their shortfall in revenue to be. Um, in this case, they might place the trigger location and limit, um, an allocate limit based on the population density. Right? So, so you can see there in the bottom box there, a bunch of different um, uh, trigger locations. So, so don't worry about the, the kind of trying to capture each one. Uh, just really trying to communicate. Um, we're putting uh, points and allocating limit based on where people actually live, which should then be tied to if there's damage in the, in the higher populated areas, that's going to lead to more pain from a revenue perspective for the, for the county uh, than if, if um, you know, for example, damage in less populated areas. Still bad, but not as bad as the more populated areas from this particular perspective. So uh, we might put points, you, for example, we could use zip code centers, allocate limit based on the density of the population in each of those zip codes, uh, and, and that should, should replicate quite well the pain that the client's going to feel, in this case, the county. Uh, and and the, the parametric cover provides broad coverage for potentially long-term revenue shortfalls resulting from a hurricane affecting the area. So you can see the theme. We've defined our trigger locations here in this case. We've defined our data provider. Here in this case, again, we use uh, RMS HWIN for our storm cover. And we've defined our policy terms. So very similar in structure. Obviously, you can see the, the way that this is used is very, very different. So why does this work? So we look at our structure again. So the green parametric cover here uh, is now, now fills up the red retention that was previously red. Uh, so now the client has sort of transferred that, that risk of of long-term revenue loss, tax revenue loss um, from them, their own balance sheet, so to speak, to, to us, to our parametric insurance cover. And so 
Uh, the, the, the reason this works is uh, the parametric cover, again, provides broad coverage. Any financial loss associated with the event, that would certainly include lost tax revenue as a result of, of uh, hurricane damage in the area, um, which is also, in effect, excluded by any traditional cover. Um, and the quick payout allows them to, again, receive liquidity quickly to begin to address those shortfalls that arise as time goes on. So very powerful here in terms of covering. You know, this is a, a great example of the broad coverage and, and the way in which this affords our insureds a lot of flexibility in terms of how they use this um, to, to ultimately address some shortfalls they have on, on the traditional insurance side. So our final message here, um, parametric NACCAD insurance coverage can help cover um, non-damage business interruption or non-damage extra expense exposures. Very good. So um, a, a quick plug, uh, and then I, again, I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions here for our Innovative Risk Solutions team. Uh, so we're a lean team of, of five nationally, um, uh, kind of split pretty evenly west and, and east coast. Uh, so you know, ultimately, we, we do many different things, uh, but among those is, is certainly focus on uh, the various uses of parametric covers that, that we've discussed today. So um, we really look forward to working with, with you. Feel free to reach out to anybody on our team um, in, in any area, and, and we're happy to explore these solutions with you and your clients. Cole, thank you so much. That was a fantastic deep dive into uh, our parametric solutions, um, and I think very, very helpful for the audience to go through some actual case studies here. Um, so let's get on to Q&A. A lot have come in throughout the presentation, and I could see a lot flying in right now. Um, there's a number of questions about the claims, our experience with claims, and kind of the claims process. So could you talk a little bit about our claims experience with parametric solutions, um, and then I guess as you're addressing that, discuss what support is needed um, to substantiate a claim? Sure, happy to, Chris. That's a great question. Uh, so we're actually quite excited. Um, uh, I think by the end of this year, we will have paid out on an earthquake parametric claim, uh, a, a hurricane or storm parametric claim as well as a hail parametric claim. Uh, so we're, we're really building up some excellent uh, experience in paying these claims, which is really where the rubber meets the road, you know? Uh, and, and, and all of these um, have, have adjusted exactly the way we expected. Uh, we had happy clients, uh, which, is, which is always great. That's the end goal. Um, and, and, and they behaved exactly the way we intended them to and, and they were intended to. So, um, so, so that's, that's the kind of the, the great news in terms of our track record here. And, and we, we continue to build uh, a broader and broader kind of set of claims we've paid and, and continues to reinforce these are behaving exactly the way we expect them to. Uh, and, and more importantly, our clients expect them to. Um, so to address, Chris, the question around um, the claims process. So we touched on it a little bit, but I'll, I'll dive in just a little bit deeper because I'm sure a number of folks have those questions. So, um, you know, typically how this would work, uh, again, as we mentioned, this is an insurance policy. So um, we would look to get notice from the insured. So, you know, that notice would essentially say, hey, Swiss Re, I've been affected by this event. Uh, I'd like you to start your event reporting process. Right, so that's in effect what allows us to start the event reporting process, which is we go to our data provider, we grab the data, um, we look at the intensity of the event as reported by our pre-agreed data provider, we compare that to the payout table that was pre-agreed ahead of time, and if the intensity threshold is met or exceeded, we release the payment. Uh, now again, typically uh, about a year later, so the insured has time to kind of figure out how that loss evolves over time. Typically about a year later, the insured would attest to us um, that the loss as defined by the policy, which again is, is, is quite broad, any financial loss associated with the event, really no exclusions, um, sublimits, uh, financial deductibles, um, anything like that. 
they would attest that that loss met or exceeded the parametric payout. So in other words, I'm attesting to you, Swiss Re, uh, that I've not profited from this insurance cover. Right? Um, now in terms of substantiation, that's really all we require. So th there's no boots on the ground claims adjustment. There's no forensic accountants. There's no counting receipts. Um, you know, it is a legal attestment from the insured, uh, but that's really all we need to substantiate. There, there's really nothing beyond that. Hopefully that answers the question, Chris. It does. Um, and there, there's actually a related question, kind of going a little bit further. Um, what happens if, um, well, I, let me actually read this. Can the insured return funds if the actual loss is less than the parametric payout? How does that work? Yep. Yep, that's a great question. Yep, great, great question, Chris. So yes, technically, uh, just fully transparently, that the insured would, if if there is a difference between um, the, the parametric payout and the loss, in other words, if the parametric payout is higher uh, than the ultimate loss uh, over time, you know, the, the, so a year later, the insured, they had their payout, they saw how the loss evolved, and they said, you know what, I I I was made totally whole. Um, you know, I still owe you Swiss Re, you know, $100,000 or $200,000 back or whatever. Technically, they would owe us that money back, um, and, and we would we would t take care of, you know, how we sort of handle that logistically. The good news is, or I guess the silver lining is, that that truly does mean, given how broad the definition of loss is, that truly does mean the insured was made totally whole, right? Uh, and, and I think that's that's actually good news for everybody. So, in that scenario, on the surface, it may seem like, ah, I don't want to return money. Um, but what that means is, under this insurance policy, you were made totally whole, right? Which, which ultimately is, is kind of the goal. So yes, they would owe the money back, and we would figure out logistically how to handle that, Chris. Thanks, Cole. Um, a number of questions around how parametric insurance interact with the traditional insurance program. I mean, you showed that in some of the case studies, but in terms of like the other insurance treatment, how it's recognized under traditional insurance policies, can you comment on that, Cole? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, so for, from our perspective, and I, I understand the nature of the question, so first of all, from, from our standpoint, in our parametric insurance policy, there is no other insurance clause, right? Now, the, the crux of the question, though, is how does the other insurance clause in the traditional policy interact with the parametric, right? In other words, can my traditional insurer deny a claim because I've bought this parametric thing over here, right? Can they consider that other insurance or try to sit excess of that or, or what have you? Uh, it's a really good question, uh, and, and we don't believe that they can. And we, we haven't seen any, any NatCat claim be adjusted that way. And, and almost by definition, you know, the traditional insurer cannot invoke the other insurance claim because by definition, the parametric claim is, is much, or the, the parametric definition of loss is much broader. So by definition, the parametric cover is filling in the gaps that traditional insurance would not cover anyway. Right, um, so so it, it's a bit akin. They're obviously not not uh, the same thing, but it's a bit akin to a, a deductible buy down, if you will. Right, so it, a traditional insurer can't say, "Hey, you bought this deductible buy down, so I'm going to reduce my claim," because by definition, it's infilling that deductible that the traditional insurance is not covering. Right, so. Um, Great question. We, we don't believe, nor have we seen any evidence that a traditional insurer could use their other insurance clause uh, and invoke that to ultimately deny or reduce a traditional NACAT claim. Uh, because again, by definition, our parametric cover is covering the stuff that traditional would not cover anyway. It's a really great question. Cole, number of questions, of course, around parametric triggers for pandemics. Uh, can you comment on that? Sure, yeah. So, so the, the very short answer <laughs> is that we at Swiss Re do not have an appetite um, for, for pandemic exposure. Um, conceptually, are there ways to, to potentially structure a pandemic parametric cover? Uh, potentially, um, you know, there are WHO orders that, that you could potentially use. 
Um, again, fundamentally, we at Swiss Re do not have an appetite for that risk for a number of reasons. Um, it, it's a very, very difficult risk to insure, um, given the fact, and we're not quite sure it's insurable to begin with. Um, very difficult because there's really no benefit of diversification or what have you. So totally understand the nature of the question, and I know everybody is, is really trying to figure out how to address this. Um, from a parametric perspective, is it, is it conceptually possible to structure something? Uh, probably yes. Would we at Swiss Re have an appetite for such a cover? Uh, no, we would not. Good question. Cole, a number of questions uh, around kind of rates online and the pricing of these products uh, for both the Quake and the Storm product that we offer. So can you, can you comment a little bit about rate online, pricing, um, and such? Sure, yeah. So, so there, there are a number of different factors that obviously can impact the pricing significantly. So, you know, the, the, the peril that you're talking about, right, what are you covering? Uh, earthquake versus hurricane versus hail, um, uh, for example, or where you're attaching, right? Uh, so, so are you attaching really low for lower intensity events, or are you just attaching really high for the higher intensity ones and the clients retaining the lower ones, right? Um, finally, geographic, you know, area, right? So if, if you're talking about South Florida versus, you know, uh, New Jersey, very different risk profile from a hurricane perspective, right? The likelihood of an intense event in South Florida is much higher, right? So, so a lot of different factors go into that, Chris. R very roughly, just, just to give kind of the audience a rough sense. So on the earthquake side, for example, if we're talking about California, we tend to find the sweet spot in, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of kind of payout table versus the budget that the client has, somewhere in the, call it 4% to 6% rate online range. So, you know, premium divided by limit, right? Um, that's kind of the sweet spot that we find. Now, it could be obviously much higher than that, um, you know, depending on where the client decides to set the trigger. But that's just kind of a real rough rule of thumb. You know, if, if, if the client, for example, is not willing to, to kind of be in that range from a budget perspective, it's going to be a difficult, uh, kind of an uphill climb, if you will. Um, hurricane is so, somewhat similar, you, you know, 4 to 5% on the lower end, you know, 6 7% kind of range. Uh, again, with the big caveat that, <laughs> you know, it can be significantly higher than that, could be a little bit lower than that. Um, but that's just the real rough kind of rule of thumb range uh, for both hurricane and earthquake, just to kind of get the conversation started. I hope that helps. I, I can't be too much more specific than that just because of the, all the different variables that come into play there, uh, but, but hopefully that gives uh, just a rough sense. Thanks, Cole. Uh, next question, are there any examples where blended or multiple trigger structures are used, and how common are these? Uh, so, so I'm, I'm sorry, Chris, say that one more time. Blended? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Triggers. Um, do we have any examples where blended or multiple trigger structures have been used? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, uh, it, it's, it's pretty rare. It's, it's possible. Um, so I'm trying to think of an example. Um, you know, you, you, you could have... Um, you could have a situation where, you know, you have a, a kind of a, a pure parametric trigger and then, you know, a second trigger where something else has to happen in order for, you know, coverage to, to kick in, right? So, so you could have something like, you know, the wind speed has to be X, but also, you know, maybe I'm just thinking of an example kind of off the top of my head, you know, say, say the insured's exposure is tied to oil price and the oil price of a certain index has to be over this, right? So in other words, they only feel pain if, you know, a hurricane happens and they get some damage, but also if, you know, maybe a, a certain other index is, is a, goes a certain way, right? Um, and, and so it's possible to, to work those in. Most of the time it's, it's you know, we're dealing with one trigger primarily. Um, that's kind of the easiest version. Um, 
there, there may be nuanced situations where we could work another trigger in. Um, we only really want to do that if, if, it's, if it's really necessary, right? We don't necessarily want to add complexity for the sake of adding complexity, but it is possible to, to sort of work in multiple triggers. Uh, so the answer is yes. We typically don't see it in practice very often, but it is possible. Cole, we, uh, next question is around um, parametric solutions for convective storms, tornadoes. Uh, can you comment about, about that as a potential solution in the future? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great one. So we, we just, uh, and, and some of you may have logged in, we, we just rolled out our, our parametric hail product earlier this year, which we're quite excited about. Um, and, and paid claims on, which, which you're actually quite excited about as well, uh, behaved exactly the way we expected it to. Um, so the natural next conversation is obviously convective storm, uh, tor tornado, you know, specifically. Um, very difficult peril to tackle. Um, and, and for those of you, you know, I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, many of you are probably logging in <laughs> from the Midwest. Um, it's a... Uh, uh, the, the peril itself, particularly tornado, is very, very localized, you know, similar to hail, but even more kind of hyper-localized. Um, also tends to be um, uh, a little bit more binary in a sense, right? So, so either it misses you entirely or it hits you directly and you're feeling major pain. Um, and, and so um, it's, it's very difficult to find a data provider with sufficient granularity. Right, so if we think about what we're trying to do again with a physical trigger, um, we're pre-adjudicating the claim essentially. Um, but what we have to make sure of is that data provider can give us data that's granular enough to be really correlated with the client's risk. Right. So if you know, for example, we 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 know that you know an EF4 touchdown somewhere, even on a zip code level, right. We don't actually know if that, you know, the, the client's exposure could be totally fine or it could be decimated, right, uh, and, and anything kind of in between. So if we can't get really down to sort of a, a latitude, longitude level, uh, it's very difficult. And, and the data available as it currently stands just isn't sufficiently granular to be able to do that. So um, unless it's a really, really kind of mega big exposure uh, and, and really geographically Diversified, there are possibly some triggers we could entertain, uh, but for the vast majority of clients, unfortunately, we just, we just haven't found a dependable, reliable third-party data provider that can give us enough granularity. So great question. We're always working on it. We haven't solved it yet. Thank you, Cole. And, and Cole, thanks again for uh, presenting today. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and to the audience, thanks for joining and spending the last hour with us. We appreciate your attention. Uh, we had so many questions. We got through a bulk of them, and there's several that we'll address separately in the coming days. We'll also be sending out a copy of the recording. Um, so if you want to watch the presentation again, you're more than welcome to um, and share that amongst your, your colleagues and peers. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you could reach out to, to me or Cole or, or anyone else on the team. Please don't hesitate. Uh, and finally, we have a number of upcoming events that I wanted to point out. Next up uh, is a webinar that's going to cover multi-year single line missiles um, titled The Coverage You Need, The Rate You Can Count On, Make a Missile Work for You Today. That's going to be on October 7th. Then we're going to discuss de-risking the global supply chain on October 13th. And we'll also look into um, non-damage BI case studies on October 21st. So keep your eyes tuned to uh, the Corso uh, feed on LinkedIn and also for our emails. And we'll also look to add more content based on your feedback, which we've been doing all along. Stay tuned for invites. Thank you so much again. Enjoy the rest of your day and take good care.